Welcome, everyone, to Magical Bringer Corona, the movie. Which has a nice dramatic opening here, the curtain rising. Thunderbolts will go at the time, anyway. It seems like they couldn't quite decide on a specific one. And in any case, here we are, the main screen. Uh, if you watched my summary of Corona, the Magical Bringer Corona, which this is a sequel to, uh, the title screen may look a little bit different. That's because the screenshots I took then were with a clear save. This is with the saves removed, so there are some things that have still to be unlocked. Uh, CG mode and free battle mode are listed here, but I can't actually enter them. Let's see if I go into sound mode. Sound mode is here, but it only has one track unlocked so far. This is the opening theme from the previous game. Which isn't otherwise used in this game, but it's here for you to see the lyrics and listen to if you want. Uh, as you progress through the game and hear more tracks, they are added here. But for now, there's nothing there. Free battle mode is not unlocked. CGO is not unlocked. Uh, system settings are pretty much what you'd expect. Uh, this does technically support a gamepad, but it expects the buttons to be in a certain configuration and you can't reconfigure them. So if they're not in that configuration, which I'm fairly certain mine are not, that just causes more confusion than not, and I'm used to playing with mouse and keyboard anyway. So what is Magical Bringer Corona, the movie? Well, as you could possibly guess from the name, this is a magical girl inspired thing. We have our magical girl here, her name is Corona. She has this ginormous sword, so there's fighting. If you go to start a new game, it suggests you look at the pamphlet. The pamphlet is basically the onboard instruction manual. And it starts off with a very brief summary of the first game. Again, if you have not played it, which I suspect most people have not, I suggest you watch my summary video, which I posted before this and will link to. Anyway, I never got around to translating the images for the pamphlet. So I'll just briefly go through these. Uh, full disclosure, I'm not uh, translating these on the fly. I do have a translation I did before up in a browser window to the side, so here's the story. Oh, you can't take the mouse off of that without disappearing. And anyway, yeah. So, Corona was a girl who dreamed of being a magical girl. Magical girl, it's like Sailor Moon, uh, Magical Lyrical Nanoha, probably she's closer to. Anyway, one day, Corona flipped into succeeding at a summoning spell, calling forth the legendary Black Demon Sword. The Demon Sword spoke of granting his host superhuman power, and Corona eagerly formed a pact to become a magical girl, as she had longed. However, the young Demon Lord Beelzebuth sensed this power and came to seal the sword away. Through help from her friends and fierce battles with the demons, Corona overcame her. Corona learned something about love through these battles and grew just slightly as the hero chosen by the Demon Sword. This is Corona, Corona Sakura, a cheerful and innocent girl who has gained vast power through a pact with the Demon Sword Osiris, or Osiris. Yeah, I'm never quite sure how to pronounce that because the Japanese writing is Oshirisu, but the usual English pronunciation, I think, is Osiris. Anyway, the Egyptian ward of the netherworld. It's kind of an appropriate name, although it's mentioned in the first game that she actually named him after their dog that they used to have. Regardless, when handling the sword, she transforms into the magical girl, Magical Bringer Corona, but there's no real point to the transformation itself. For better or for worse, she doesn't think about things deeply and can take whatever happens around her as it comes. She goes television and sweets and is better at winning people over and depending on them than she looks to be. There's the Demon Sword Osiris, a god-slaying demon sword forged on the ancient Mu continent. He has passed through numerous legends with such names as the Sun Sword Balmung and the Demon Sword Stormbringer. He has a mind of his own and fuses with a pact holder to become two minds in one body. Whether because of good or poor compatibility with Corona, he never seems to stop quarreling in her head. And there's a note at the bottom there that 
conversation with Osiris takes place inside Corona's head, so cannot be heard in their surroundings. That can be important at times, they can have a conversation at any time the people around them won't hear them. It's kind of a talking as a free action thing in battle also. This is Subaru Yoshiyumi, that's one of Corona's kind of friends. Uh, Subaru's junior, who transforms into the Magic Guru Lightning Angel Playa. Playa comes from the Pleiades, Shining in the Sky, which are called Subaru in Japanese. She specializes in controlling thunder and flies the skies at lightning speed. A hard worker and perfectionist with a strong sense of justice, she chose a path of solitude in her efforts toward perfection and wouldn't open up to anyone until persuaded otherwise by Corona. Frankly, she also kind of has a stick up her butt. Uh, perhaps because she's not used to socializing with people, she rarely approaches others on her own. This is Yuka Amanogawa. This is Corona's longtime and best friend. A girl from the shrine in the town heights, she works as a Miko and comes across as a perfectly ordinary one, but is actually heir to the Genbu mirror passed down in the shrine and can use the yin yang arts to excel at driving out evil. Her personality is calm and gentle, and she's the sort of person who wishes for others' happiness before her own, and is one of the few people that Subaru trusts. Here we have Noelle de Belzebuth, the young demon lord, head of the Belzebuth family, the second most powerful family in the demon realm. Despite appearances, she has lived for around a century and has the composed personality of an adult. She sought out the demon sword Osiris and attacked Corona, but met with defeat. Intrigued by the human who defeated her for the first time, she's moved into Corona's house. She was born with an inexhaustible supply of magic power. In the shadow of her adorable appearance lurks a brutal and ruthless madness. These two are on the right, Nyal Ratotep, and on the left, Kram Kruak. That's another game that it's kind of, the pronunciation is weird, because the Japanese writing is Kura, but it, the name comes from the old chief of the pagan Celtic gods, which is, def, as far as I can tell, definitely pronounced Kram Kruach, basically. So Kram Kruach it is. And these are Noel's subordinates, the calm and gallant knight captain Krom, and the unpredictable and capricious bodyguard Nyal. They've apparently been stuck with each other since their mercenary days, and are often together even when they're fighting over one thing or another. So that's the story of the characters. After this, it introduces the system of the game. T2neo is what they're calling the revised combat system. All the fighting in this game is settled through this T2neo system. Enjoy the various battles the girls weave to your heart's content. The rules are simple. Just press the arrow key with the corresponding direction, left up, right, or down, when one of these triangular cursors is over the judgment point with the arrow pointing to it there, as it goes by. The gauge at screen left is your opponent's stamina, and on the right is the protagonist. Whoever fully exhausts the adversary's stamina first wins the battle. Even if you lose, you can continue to re-challenge as many times as you like. It's the flow of battle. Upon entering battle, you first compete over speed in an initiative round. The blue gauge roughly in the middle of the screen is your opponent's speed, and the red gauge below that is the protagonist's speed. When the red gauge fills completely, switch to an attack round. This is the protagonist's chance to attack and reduce your opponent's stamina. Conversely, when the blue gauge fills, it switches to a guard round where you defend against attacks from your opponent. Once attacking or guarding ends, it goes back to initiative round again, and this repeats until one or the other runs out of stamina and the battle is settled. Indicators appear when you hit these cursors. Miss is a failure. Small and large hit indicate success. Critical indicates a perfect success. Each of these will influence things such as uh, how much the initiative gave fills or how much damage your attacks do. Uh, the energy gauge, that's the thing at the bottom right. This increases each time you land a close range attack. As you continue to land attacks, it adds to the counter number, which makes the increase go up faster. If you get a miss, the count resets to zero, but the gauge does not increase. 
this is an important change from the previous game in which if you miss an attack, the gauge would deplete or empty out entirely. However, in that game, really the only thing it did was power up one of your special attacks. In this game, it does more than that, as this goes on to explain. When the gauge fills two set lines, which you can see on the meter there, uh, the level display changed, and when it's displaying a level, an attack round may turn into a special round. Now, previously, those were just completely at random. In a special round, a special attack corresponding to the level at that time occurs, and your attacking power and the number of cursors will increase, so it is an ideal chance to inflict damage on your opponent. Your adversaries will also come at you with special attacks. Each of them has its own characteristics, so watch the flow of the cursors carefully while guarding. Skills. Skills can be displayed at the bottom of the static gauge, as indicated in the little image there. Those show when the character has a special ability of effect. These may greatly influence the state of combat, so take note when they're displayed. Then it lists some of the same main skills and their effect. Uh, speed X2 indicates double speed, the initiative gauge will fill twice as fast. Uh, reflect indicates a reflective defense that gives you protection with a special barrier that negates the enemy's fierce skill. And additionally, if you get a critical success, that will reflect some of the damage back at your opponent. And at the bottom is the Fear skill. That indicates an especially powerful attack. Uh, it's an enemy-only skill. Causes some damage from attacks to pierce through, even if you guard, unless it's a critical success. That is the only time where criticals actually matter in a guard round, are Reflect and Fierce. Normally, you either guard or you don't. That incidentally is how all hits worked in the previous game. There wasn't a good, better, best system. It was if you hit, you hit. If you missed, you missed. But here it's a little more complicated. Uh, this is Survivor, the Never Give Up system. When you re-challenge a battle that you lost, you can craze Corona's ability through the power of the Demon Sword by selecting Use Corona Survivor. Use of this can increase her power repeatedly until her growth reaches its limits. And depending on how many times you raise her abilities, a Corona's attack and defense, cursor difficulty during enemy special rounds, and more will change, making battle go more to Corona's advantage. Raising her abilities will guide Corona down the path of conquest, but as a result, she'll be relying on the Demon Sword's power and take her that much further away from being a fully fledged magical girl. Whether to crush opponents with the Black Demon Sword's overwhelming power, or to walk a harsher path and challenge your own limits along with Corona, which path you walk is up to you, the player. And then a nice bit of ang anguish at the bottom. That should basically be something like, don't give up, you can do it, but yeah, anguish. So basically what this survivor system does is the game has a sliding difficulty scale, where as you win battles, the difficulty will increase depending on how much health you left and how challenging the opponent is. And if you lose a battle, you have an opportunity to use this thing called Corona Survivor. What that does is it knocks 20 off the difficulty. It's just straightforward that. The difficulty starts at 30, and it can go as low as 0 or get to as high as 100 by the end of the game. So, Corona Survivor drops the difficulty, but that has another effect because when you clear the game, your difficulty at the time of clear is shown as your clear score, and that can affect some of the unlocks. So, if you're going for those, you want to avoid dropping the difficulty. But if you just want to get through the game, you use Corona Survivor and make things easier. I think what I'm going to end up doing in this playthrough is uh, basically give every battle probably two or three tries, and if I can't get through, then drop the difficulty and try again. But we'll see how that goes. Continuing on, this is the Enter key. Once in a while, an Enter will come along the bar, like the arrow cursors. You can see it at the top up there. In this case, you can press the Enter key to strike that, similar to pressing the arrows to strike the normal cursors. If this happens during an attack round, it will unleash your entire accumulated energy gauge to blast the opponent with a single devastating strike. If you prefer not to lose the gauge, you can also watch that go by, and in this case it does not interrupt your combo. 
Basically, enter attacks are always optional. That's a principle carried over from the first game. However, during the enemy's attack round, if that one of those comes through, you will take grave damage if you let that land, so be careful. There's the note there in the middle says, you can also use the enter key or left click with the mouse to cancel things like combat dialogue or special attack effects that you've already seen. And at the bottom, we have a new system in this game, the Quick Burst. When the gauges gather enough energy, you can press the Enter key in an initiative round to force the round to end immediately in exchange for one level's worth of energy. So basically, if you're at level 2, it drops to level 1, etc. And you get an attack turn immediately. Uh, when Your combo will reset to 0, but you can strike quickly in various situations, such as if you want to cut initiative short or do a, throw in a finishing attack. Uh, here we have the help for the gamepad. Basically it says, if you have an 8 button gamepad with a directional pad, you can switch to that in the system setup, but pad controls in Enscriptor, which is the engine this is running on, are still in the experimental phase. So, yeah. Also, you can't remap the buttons, so yeah. And when you're in pad mode, the keyboard input, other than the enter key, is not available. So, also, yeah. Not going to be using the gamepad. It just shows what the controls are. Below that, uh, button 1, move the cursor to the menu. Button 2, select or select a choice or advance the text. Button 3, cancel a selection or return to a previous screen. Button 7 and 8 will adjust the difficulty level in free battle mode, which will be unlocked after creating the game. And of course, the directional pad moves the cursor. And then during battle mode, the four buttons in the... Yeah, the four main buttons are up, down, left, and right. But again, I don't think those actually correspond to those on the controller I have, which I think is the standard Xbox-type button setup. So, yeah, it's basically useless for this if you can't dream out the buttons. Uh, it also notes at the bottom there, the enter button is handled separately from the enter key. So you would use the shoulder button to hit enter in combat, but for the enter key things for the keyboard, like the quick burst and skipping things, you would still use enter on the keyboard, which just makes things even more confusing. Anyway, I spent a little while going through the pamphlet, but I do want to actually start the game and just do the prologue, so... New game. There's a turn and unlock off. We have an introduction with a black screen, some wind noises in the background, typewriter sound effects, which are rather nice, and this literary quote. That is from, I believe, actually let me get my notes up. Yes, that's from Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. It's a Russian name. Anyway, Notes from Underground. So that, of course, was written in Russian. That's a rough translation of what the line was. Basically, as I understand it, since I've never actually played that or read that book, um, the that was said by someone called the Underground Man. He's a bitter recluse. So, here we are. Blue and white. In sharp contrast, the blue of the ocean and the white of the ice. In faint gradation, the blue of the sky and the white of the clouds. Uh, the narrator, incidentally, is Corona, except when other eyes indicated. Her name may or may not have some connection to English Corona, like uh, Crown. 70 degrees north latitude, the intensely cold atmosphere bears its fang and howls. Whoa, we've come all the way to the Arctic. I wonder if there's any penguins. Something that does not come through in the translation is when Corona is not in her magical girl persona, her name is displayed in kanji. Uh, when she is, it's displayed in hiragana. I'm not exactly sure why that is. I think they're trying to kind of riff on the alternate identity thing, and also the fact that Corona doesn't really do a very good job of alternate identitying. She basically changes outfits and does the little bit of thing with her name because that's what you do as a magical girl, but she doesn't really have the whole why you would do that down. 
Anyway, I'm not sure how to handle that in English shows. Corona is just Corona. She also has a very carefree and casual kind of personality, and that comes through in her speech also. I've tried to preserve that in the translation, where she comes off as kind of a little goofy, really. Here we have Noel, the Demon Lord. Leave the sightseeing for later. Let us begin at once. Noel, much calmer personality most of the time. She also has a very archaic kind of feel to her speech, so we'll be seeing a lot of thous and thoughts and whatever as we get into the thing. It's also kind of odd that she does that because no one else does, and there are characters who are older than she is, so who knows. Maybe it's just for effect. Ah, uh, we're starting already? That is why we came. Oh, come on, you're so pushy, noel John. Yeah, that's something I... That's right there is one thing I would do differently or if I were translating this now. I left in all the name suffixes like chans and sans and samas and all that. If I were doing it now, I would leave that out and try to try to convey it by tone. It just feels more natural in English that way. But this is how I did it, so this is how it is. I am the demon lord Belzebuth. Now this is Belzebuth is more commonly spelled Beelzebub. Translating roughly to Ward of the Flies or Ward of Flying Things. Literary tradition holds Beelzebub to be the second highest of demons. The, the game references this in the Beelzebub family being the second most powerful. Outranked only by Lucifer himself, though given how all the major characters in the Corona world seem to be girls or women, maybe that would be Lucifer herself here, but... The character is only mentioned in passing, so who knows. Anyway, the Japanese writing that the game uses is... Belzebuta. So, not Belzebub. Closer to Belzebuth, so I'm going with that. Can't help that you're Belzebuth. Corona, you're doing this. So here we have an example of the conversation going on in Corona's head that's indicating this game by parentheses around the text itself. Oh, Osiris. I'm keeping Noel's Chan company for a bit now. Would you help out? Save the sleep talk for your sleep. In the first place, to use my power for sport with the Demon Lord. Why don't you try having your blade overused every time you play? I can't stand the irritation. Go ahead and have your fun. Don't be so sulky. Okay, fine. I'll manage my, my own. And here we have our first battle. Now, normally, Doa will be a rather powerful opponent. She is this very strong demon lord, after all. However, this is the first battle in the game, and they're also basically having a play fight, so this is more of an introduction to the battle system. Uh, you have these cursors coming along, as mentioned, when they're over this target point, you press the corresponding button, and it does a thing. In initiative round, it fills up your initiative gauge, proportional to how good your timing is. You want to try to get as close to the center as possible, as is typical with kind of a rhythm sort of game. This isn't really a rhythm game because it's not... It doesn't go according to the rhythm of the music or any other specific timing. But it's the same general concept where there's a cursor there, you try to hit it. A light warm-up, perhaps. Yeah. Guard round. Again, normally in guard rounds, you either hit or miss. So you don't need to worry too much about the timing on that. As long as you get it, you don't take damage. So in initiative rounds, the better your hit is, the more your gauge will fill. That's the second gauge on the bottom in the middle there. When it fills up, it's your attack turn. And then in attack round, the better your timing is, the more damage your hit does. I think the better hits will also fill up your energy bar at the bottom faster. As you can see, I'm blowing through her health pretty quickly. Again, this is basically a warm-up play fight. So, Noel's not trying all that hard. Later battles will take much longer to finish the fight. 
you can go through dozens of attack rounds and multiple specials before finally they admit defeat and the battle ends. Also with that sliding difficulty scale, as that increases, your damage is scaled down, enemy damage is scaled up, they'll also get more hits in their attacks and the attack patterns will get more complicated. Some also get various special effects. We'll be seeing more of that later. For now, again, it's basically a warm-up play fight, so there's nothing fancy happening here. Uh, you'll notice in that last attack round, we got enough energy bar for the charge to fill to level 1. Now, and here's our first enemy special. The specials in this game have more special effects going on in the intro. You'll get literary and biblical quotes. More special effects. My turn. There's something for Shakespeare there. Tempest. For whatever reason, uh, Noelle's attacks, special attacks are written in the symbol font. So it's basically fake Greek. I think that kind of goes along with the concept that the... I get the impression this archaic sort of thing she's doing is kind of an affectation. So that kind of goes along with that, although it could just be that whoever did this didn't know any better. I love that effect. The power of Stormbringer. Uh, so the Stormbringer name comes from the Elric series. Elric of Melibane, I think it is. Where he has a demonic sword called Stormbringer that's... Yeah, anyway. So your special attack rounds, you will get more hits in your attack, the attacks themselves are more regular to make it easier to hit. Also in your special rounds, it does not matter how well, how good your timing is, it's either hit or miss, and a hit does full damage regardless. So basically everything's a critical, even if it doesn't say critical. So yeah, that was just a nice quick little war up fight, and Karen is like, eh heh I win. I see, just think hast won, though I suppressed my power to its barest minimum. Then it would seem I need not hold back! No, 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 Chan, that's not what I- oh, Hold on, hold on, don't go out, stop, stop! I know full well just how strong a demon lord is. No, Chan, if you go out in a place like this, the arctic ice is gonna melt, okay? Okay? Then try to stop me! Behold, the hellfire of Belzebuth, burning all to ashes! Hold on, not your strongest move all of a sudden. Ground Zero. Yeah, we're not going to see the attack itself at this point, but yeah, that is her strongest attack, and it's quite nasty when you see it. And here's Corona making kind of a trademark noise she does. It's kind of... So that was the prologue. This is going straight into Act 1 at this point, so I'm going to stop this here for now, and we'll continue next time with Act 1 of Magical Bringer Corona, the movie. We have the Chicada Scarping. Uh, before this ends, I'll just go far enough to save the game and show how that goes. We have a system menu at the bottom here. You click save. You get this bank of save games. I'm going to be saving fairly often because I haven't tested the translator script as much as I should have. And it's possible that something will go wrong and I'll need to make changes on the fly. So. So save game. The save game will show a little thumbnail screenshot of where it was saved. It also has at the bottom of that a summary well, not a summary, but a little indication of where in the game this is. So I had to abbreviate it, get it. We have MBK for Magical Bigger Corona movie, Act 1. There are five acts to the story, and then something unexpected happens, which we'll get to when we get to it. So for now, this has been Era Fallon playing Magical Bringer Corona the movie. I'm kind of excited to be doing this. I wasn't expecting it to... Well, I knew it would be coming up eventually because I've had this plan for a while, but 
It felt like Zix's role would just keep going, going in. It's kind of surreal to actually be starting this. So, yeah, I'm kind of excited for this. I hope everyone else is interested, and see you next time.